Good evening, everyone. My name is Juliane Kempfield. I'm the director here at Deutsches Haus at NYU. On behalf of the Department of German, the Department of Comparative Literature at NYU, and Deutsches Haus at NYU, it is my pleasure to welcome you to The Dash, a conversation among Slavoj Žižek, Rebecca Komei, and Frank Ruda, focusing on Rebecca's and Frank's book, The Dash, The Other Side of Absolute Knowing. Let me thank our speakers for being here tonight. We're very appreciative uh, of you shedding light on the dash. And let me thank the various wonderful colleagues over at the German department, the Komplett department, and my colleagues here at Deutsches Haus for working on putting this together. Thank you, everybody. A big shout out to Lindsay O'Connor, who always makes a lot of miracles happen. And uh, I will not mention everybody else by name, but it's a pleasure to work with you. Thank you. And uh, yes. <laughs> and thank you, the DEA AD, the German Academic Exchange Service, for their support of our academically inclined programs. And uh, last but not least, the speakers. Uh, you were looking at me and you inspired me yesterday with something you said, so I will just be very brief about the speakers. Um, they were born, they write, and they will die sooner or later. <laughs> if you want more biographical information, you may look it up on our website. And uh, um, So deal with that. Please join me in welcoming our panelists. Thank you so much. Uh, we arrange it because it's their event, so that I will briefly further introduce them, then they, the two of them, will engage in a dialogue about the book, not endless, they know what they will talk about, about the book, then I will add some uh, finishing thoughts, which will culminate in a question to both of them, and then when we finish this cycle, there should be some time for, uh, for uh, Q&A. So let me begin. Rebecca and Frank, I think it's something breathtaking to have both of them here. I'm quite serious here. First, Rebecca. You know, people often accuse me of being ironic, me too, making fun, not being a pessimist. But as a Hegelian, uh, not being a feminist, <laughs> but as a Hegelian, there is no choice but not being a pessimist in this pathetic sense. Oh, look, even women can write a book on Hegel. But it's very simple. In the last 20, 25 years, practically all really good books on Hegel, I don't know what this means, were written by women. It started, was it 30 more years ago, with, uh, with Gillian Rose, Hegel contra sociology, then it was Beatrice Longanes, Hegel and the critique of metaphysics, then it was Catherine Malabou, the future of Hegel, then it is her, Rebecca's incredible, path-breaking book, uh, The Morning Sickness. Uh, so, uh, which, uh, this one is, of course, also about Hegel. But what I'm saying is that I cannot even say what unites those books. But what I'm proud to say, again, is that you don't have to do in this pseudo-feminist, male chauvinist way, or, yeah, look, even women can do it. No, they are simply doing it better than us men. So I'm really even getting a little bit angry at them. I mean, <laughs> how can they? Now, much more seriously, what is so incredible about her book is that it's beyond these cheap dilemmas, criticism of Hegel, uh, yes or not, and so on. It's simply a wonderful, deconstructive, immanent reading with a very precise thesis that morning sickness I'm talking now, that uh, if I uh, if I uh, resume it correctly, that when he deals in phenomenology with, uh, in a coded way, French Revolution, absolute freedom, terror, that Hegel cannot really recuperate from that point. 
it doesn't work, all the Aufhebungen then later and so on. And I think we should elevate this into a general principle. Let me give you, to conclude with her, another example. I'm sorry, this time from a man. I am always uh, involved in a polemic with Robert Pippin, but he made one remark of such a total common sense, which is nonetheless so intelligent, I think. He said, you know, this usual accusation, Hegel is describing a society of a certain type, it's a half proto-fascist, half liberal, whatever you want, ideal of a rational state, but uh, does this still hold and so on? Isn't it dated? But wait a minute. In his, the most famous passage maybe of uh, philosophy of right, Hegel says, you know, that famous metaphor that philosophy can grasp an epoch when the all of Minerva takes flight in the evening only when its time is over. Now, isn't there a clear conclusion from this? Either Hegel was a total idiot who didn't know what he is doing, or he was not providing an ideal society. In his philosophy of right, he is describing something whose time is already passing. He is describing a lost moment which is already disappearing. And this is now my reading, which is why I will stop. Here Hegel is more materialist than, than Marx. Marx is still too idealist, too theological for Hegel. Hegel would have never allowed for a position conceptualized by Marx that as a proletarian agent, the way Lukács describes it, that you can be a historical agent who, at the same time, from a relatively perfect knowledge of history, you do something and you know what you are doing. Enough of this, briefly, Frank. Uh, uh, he did, uh, among other things, publishing a lot, uh, already his first book, it is in English, about Pebel, rebel, the notion of rebel in Hegel. This is, for me, such a beautiful book, uh, why? Because it is critical towards Hegel, but not in the standard, that's the beauty, Marxian sense. Hegel just saw Pebel, rebel, he was not able to conceptualize it in the Marxian sense of proletariat. No, it's a wonderful, precise point of criticizing Hegel through Hegel himself. He shows first how to analyze our society today. The notion of rebel in all its forms gained new actuality. It's again maybe more appropriate than Marxist, uh, the Marxist notion of prole proletariat. And where Hegel is, and that's the beauty, that's the only way to overcome Hegel, not Hegelian enough. Hegel describes, as you know, Pebel as the part of no part, to use more contempt, those who are necessarily produced by society, but for whom a strata, there is no proper place within the social edifice. The conclusion, I simplify you, that Hegel was afraid to draw, but should have, is that as such, rebel stands for universality. That precisely as this outside element, which does not have a particular place within social body, it, is the, it stands for universality of a society. I've already spoken too much just to tell you how happy I am, and I should also thank you all. It's breathtaking. What went wrong? Why, there are more people here than on my classes. <laughs> but I should be the big one. Like, what is happening that? So I'm really glad about this. I think this shows that, although everybody wants now to fight about me to criticize Trump and so on, that's not the real thing. To put it in shamelessly idealist way, the spirit is happening here. We don't all get become new John Stewarts or whatever and get involved in the cheap comedy. Please, it's up to you. <laughs> Thanks. Um, thank you, Slavoj, for, for so generously introducing us and being here and engaging with our book tonight. And I just wanted also to thank uh, Lindsay and Juliana and Jasmine, the Deutsches House in the German department for their wonderful organizing. Frank and I thought we would say a few words back and forth about um, what, what this book is about and what started it and some of the, some of the uh, implications of this book.
Um, and really, we started quite accidentally before we knew each other. It was kind of a random coincidence that both of us, uh, when we first met, discovered that we had both been kind of obsessing about a punctuation mark in Hegel, um, two different ones. Um, I had been kind of fretting about the concluding sentence in, in the Phenomenology of Spirit, where Hegel, um, in a very grammatically ambiguous way, sort of stops writing at the, at the very end of the phenomenology and um, interpolates a, a dash and then um, it, it adds this strange epigram by Schiller, which doesn't entirely make sense. And the tempting thing has always been to say, oh, he's lapsing into literature, philosophy is not finishing or something like that. But, it, but um, there seemed to be a lot going on there. And at the same time, Frank um, was, um, had been thinking about the first sentence of the Science of Logic, the kind of companion text and sequel to the phenomenology in some very enigmatic sense, um, a first sentence which doesn't begin till about page 58 or something like that, but it, 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 it also is actually ungrammatical. You have the two sentences on the, um, on the book cover here, being pure being with, with this interruption. Um, and with these, this, uh, it, that was really our starting point. And what if you actually put these two sentences together, um, which as the end of one book and the beginning of another book, an end and beginning which are, which are joined not immediately by, by, by after this kind of thicket of paratextual material that some, somehow stands in between. What if we put them together um, and use this as a kind of prism uh, for thinking about really the most fundamental and notorious questions of, of Hegel, the question of closure, the question of ending, the question of beginning, and what the relationship between these might be. So that was our, that was our experiment. And um, we should say at the outset that in focusing um, quite perversely on this little detail, we're not really trying to prove Hegel wrong because he used dashes. Um, rather, rather quite the opposite. Um, Hegel, in this, in his, in his strange method of writing, actually um, shows us how to read and extract the really speculative resources of his of his thinking. So, so I'm gonna uh, step in here and also hide from my side. Um, I'm um, I'm not repeating the the gratitude, but I'm grateful for this to happen to all of you. Anyhow, so. Two weird sentences, right? A longish one at the end of the phenomenology and a shortish one, which is very strange because it doesn't even, there's no article in the sentence, there's no verb, it's not really a sentence. And so, in a sense, what we try to figure out is what are we doing if we're focusing in on these two sentences? And is there a kind of methodology, if you wish, that allows us to say something about these maybe merely accidental facts that he put two dashes in two important sentences, right? And we, and in, in a sense, we applied, I mean, and depending on the, on the phrasing, a, a psychoanalytic or a Freudian insight that certain things, I mean, think of parapraxis, right? I mean, uh, my friend Aaron Schuster uh, told me that joke. Uh, you, parapraxis, you want to say one thing and you say a mother, right? I mean, I got that from you, I think. So in a sense, right, it is not accidental, right? I mean, uh, so there is, if you wish, written <coughs> in history or there is something to interpret or there, I mean, it doesn't happen totally arbitrarily in the sense. And so we wondered, what if from a Hegelian, that would be the different second phrasing, there's not only reason in history, but there is reason in punctuation, right? Uh, there's reason in punctuation marks. Maybe there's a reason, right? There's a rationality. Um, it's not totally arbitrary, but there is something to mine out of these weird details, right? That he uses these, these two dashes. And in a sense, if you start thinking about that, this is at least what we try to do then. Um, one, one can immediately apply one of the most notorious, maybe Hegelian concept, maybe the concept of the concrete universal to these very dashes, because if you start reading something very concrete and treat it as if it is totally necessary, right? I mean, as if there is reason in punctuation marks, you may end up saying something universal or general about the system as such, right? I mean, it's not if that, uh, these, these two, like the ending and the beginning sentence, if there is 
right, the reason why he punctuated the way he did. Maybe that can give us a clue, and that was our hunch, if you wish, or the gamble. That, that could say something about actually the status of the Hegelian system. And that is, again, not totally arbitrary, but Hegel himself accounts for a necessary form of presentation of what he's trying to present, whatever you want to call it, the logic of the absolute of freedom, or whatever you, you think he is doing. Because he talks about, uh, in the phenomenology, in the introduction to the phenomenology, uh, about what he calls a speculative sentence or a speculative proposition, which is precisely the mode of presentation of the absolute he believes. And then, weirdly, in the, uh, in, the, in the Science of Logic, so the sequel, book, whatever that's supposed to say, he talks not about speculative propositions or sentences, but about speculative words. Right? So words that somehow, in one signifier, entail a multiplicity of different, even sometimes contradictory meanings. And so we thought, well, he didn't say that, but maybe there are speculative signs, right? It's true. Maybe the dash could be a speculative sign. Um, saying he's, it is doing many things at once, and maybe that, that's the whole point of the dash, right? Maybe there's something, a speculative insight to be mined out of it. So that doesn't lead us at all, or didn't lead us to basically assume that Hegel is using a kind of technical language, as he always refused to do, but just simply reading what is there, right? I mean, you're just, and it's kind of just, just the English, uh, translations, uh, they omit the dash, I mean, the, the previously existing ones, which is strange, right, because it's not so hard to translate. Um, <laughs> anyhow, okay, um, stop here, maybe. Right, just moving on here, the idea of moving from, um, and this is, this is Hegel's reading protocol that we're really taking literally, uh, um, that um, that to read speculatively is to um, is to encounter and to to extrapolate from and to to think on the basis of some um, of, of an ambiguity in language which seems to point in seemingly opposed directions. And as he taught us to read his uh, to read grammar or syntax, a given sentence um, can be read the regular way, subject verb predicate, um, but also without changing the wording can be read um, a very different way, one which really transforms the metaphysical categories in which we think. And likewise, the kind of speculative words that Hegel um, delights in finding in his native language, German, but the issue is not about German or any other national language, it just happens to be the words that he stumbles upon. Um, a word like famously Aufhebung and a number of other words um, are doing m multiple things at once. Um, but our, and our, our hunch um, in, in looking at these ambiguous sentences and the way in which the punctuation actually works so ambiguously, ambivalently, um, is to really, um, to, to move from the syntactic level um, through the semantic level of words to the, you know, which is what we could call a pragmatic level of, of, of enunciation, what, which is, what is punctuation itself doing? Um, and part of this relates to the kind of um, the fractal dimension of Hegel's thought that things get, the units get smaller and smaller. Um, and in this grain of, you know, this grain of sand, um, one, one, one can perceive a kind of microcosmic um, indication of the whole. But also, um, it's telling us, you know, it's telling us what to do. And the, 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 the speculative um, ambiguities of this particular punctuation mark, and it's really important that not every, um, sometimes a, a, a dash is just a dash. Um, <laughs> so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, but these particular ones um, really seem to be doing two things at once. Um, that is to say that te the temporal orientation um, is, is ambivalent. A dash, you know, breaks up a sentence. It, in breaking it up, it, point, it precipitates you to, uh, to an ending that you don't know whether it's stopping, whether it's going to be resumed, whether it's a parenthetical dash, which is going to be followed by another dash, and the main sentence is going to, you don't know. You don't know when you encounter it, whether um, it's an interruption, and an end, a kind of hesitation, a momentary detour, and so on. And there's a kind of, there's a kind of delay and suspension, which is also produces this retroactive um, effect of making us return to the beginning, it makes us read what precedes the dash in, very, um, in, in a new way. So it's a kind of, it's a kind 
kind of movement of incompletion um, and, and, and interruption, and the, the word English word dash is, of course, very suggestive because it's doing so many things con connected with, with speed and destruction and um, ephemerality, you know, dashing off something, and, and, and so on and so forth. The German word, Gedankenstrich, it, it has its own, um, you know, its own beauty um, in, it, in, in so far as it's, it, it refers to a, it seems to indicate a, a barring or cancellation of thought, a pause of thought, but also pause in thought, but also a kind of striking out of thought. This is a kind of a moment, an elliptical moment where, where thought seems to suspend itself. Um, and it's in this, it's in this really uncertainty of thinking um, that, that, that the repetitive uh, force of thought comes to the fore. And our one of our one of our questions whether the the the, the repetition that every dash um, both both entails insofar as it forces a, a return to the beginning, but also invites and anticipates because a dash may or may not be followed by a, by its own sequel. I mean, in this virtual and, and real repetition that is staged by the dash, um, our 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 question was really: is this a, is this a peculiar case of of Hegel's? favored trope, the negation of the negation. Is this actually a, a, a performance of what that reflexive negativity might mean? So, yeah. yeah. I mean, because in a, in a sense, right, I mean, one dash can interrupt a sentence, and the other one establishes continuity with creating like a weird <laughs> intermediary zone between, right, I mean, which even obeys its own grammatical syntactic rules. And so we, in addressing those two dashes at one at the beginning of the logic, one at the end of the phenomenology, we, we ended up talking about the transition from one book to the other, or about transition in general, and about what, in one way or the other, is at stake at that point, namely, sort of clearing the slate. That's what um, the phenomenology kind of does. It was once called the presupposition for a presuppositionless science. You kind of need the phenomenology to begin with the project that then, whatever that project is, the science of logic begins. I mean, Hegel describes it in most grandiose terms because what the logic is actually doing, it is depicting, like exhibiting, expounding the thoughts that God had before he created the world and finite beings, he says, right? So, it's right, we're reading the mind of God before or in the act of creating, creating the world. So, right, there is no world. He, he she, it is kind of alone, God, I mean, um, is kind of alone. So what is at stake immediately in this transition is what does it mean to begin, right? To, to begin anew, to create a new world, right? With all the stuff that is implied. And what does it mean that one has to do a lot of things, I mean, it's not a very thin book, the phenomenology, I mean. Right? One has to go through it if it's a presupposition for a presuppositionless science to get to the point where one can begin, right? So there is a lot of things to be done before one can start anew, right? It's not that easy. So in that transition, somehow, this very question, what does it mean to begin, what does it mean to dash off the old, if you wish, right, is at stake. So maybe. Right, and so um, with this seemingly random um, and ultra particular detail, um, we seem to be thrown right into the kind of the beast of the belly, um, that is say into the heart of absolute knowing, the most grandiose and enigmatic and ridiculous and, and reviled um, and, and kind of incomprehensible part of Hegel's system, um, which has always been a sort of, has, or certainly has become, I shouldn't say, has become, what was, was an outrage for, for a good century and has become a kind of embarrassment to, uh, to Hegel readers. Um, so from the, you know, from the first century and a half of, of, of um, non-orthodox 
um, Hegel readers, Hegel, Hegel critics, um, absolute knowing is incarnating this, this kind of um, monstrous um, megalomaniac, narcissistic effacement of, 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 of history, of politics, of um, individuation, to the contemporary attempts to rehabilitate Hegel to, by, by, by making him more palatable, um, namely by, by um, proposing deflationary readings which which kind of lop off that side of the system which is so which is so embarrassing um, what if the you know what if what if the dash um, our, our strategy is kind of the opposite of the deflationary readings of Hegel in a certain sense um, in that these readings which are which are the dominant readings today um, tend to prune back the grandiosity of Hegel's system by by stopping reading at a point where he veers into kind of insanity um, our, our reading is um, kind of inflationary in that it takes um, from these minor moments, um, it, 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 it shows how these minor moments actually precipitate this, this plunge into um, what, um, what is called absolute knowing and forces us to think about what that could possibly possibly mean. And hence, um, we come to the most notorious moment, but also the most notorious transition itself, the end of the phenomenology and, its, and, and the transition to something, um, as Frank said, um, sounds even more preposterous, the thinking of God uh, before, the, before the creation. And it's, and it's quite peculiar that if, I mean, if you just try to understand how these two books are related, right? I mean, I, we, we just said, it, was once coined to be the, the phenomenology, to be the uh, presupposition for a presupposition of science, but it's, Hegel called it the first part and the introduction to the system, of which weirdly the science of logic is the first part. So we have two first parts, um, which is odd, right? So we have a weird repetition. So what is that? What, what is the relation between the two books? And even more astoundingly, uh, different from what one immediately would assume if you hear, I mean, if you just hear the name Hegel, you would assume system many books or something like that, or all the books in a certain edition. But he, that's kind of what we're trying to argue at least, he basically only wrote two books, which is very odd. And because, I mean, the rest of the things you get are kind of handbooks to use for his lectures, so that guide you through the lectures. Right? I mean, you can study, but, but they need clarification by someone speaking right, in, in front and you need to listen because otherwise you don't understand. So these are the only two books you could read in the sense, right? Um, and then there are lecture notes, of course, they're amazing to read, but they're, they have been compiled, pi, compiled afterwards, right? I mean, so they're not books in the sense, so why two, right? I mean, that was, why, why two books? And what is the relation between the two books? I mean, he could have written one book, or five, but he just wrote right, two. So two sumness, or the question of the relation between the two, became a problem. Maybe I'll stop here. Right. So why why only two, and why two at all? Hmm. So um, for for a for a philosopher whose intention was to to produce many more books and who has always been castigated for being a thinker of, of the one. So two seems to be both too few and and too many for the you know for Hegel's own self conception and for the the, the general perception of, of Hegel as a monistic metaphysician. Um, so why, why two? Um, and it's interesting, so Hegel, as Frank was saying, wrote the introduction, wrote, wrote the phenomenology, which was to do the introduction for a, uh, for the, for, for a three-part work, the, 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 the science of logic, which was completed by the philosophy of nature and a philosophy of spirit, and, and, and he, he kind of stopped. Um, after writing the big logic, what he does is, instead of giving us the book form of the philosophy of nature that should have followed it, he gives us a, another logic, a kind of recapitulation and mini miniaturized uh, copy of the logic, um, and so on. Um, so what is this, yeah, what is this, what, what is the, how, in what sense does this, um, does this strange pair, the uh, phenomenology and the logic, what work is it doing? One of the, um, one of the endless questions that Hegel never stops asking and that Hegel's readers never stop asking is, is, is Hegel's relationship to, to Kant. Um, Hegel's notorious um, gesture 
towards Kant's um, careful demarcation and delimitation um, of the bounds of, of experience, the, the, um, the, the curtailing of the kinds of questions that could be posed without falling into um, antinomies or contradictions. Hegel's, Hegel's rebuke to Kant, um, which is partly a formal one, but had a, had a huge, you know, huge, the stakes were huge, was that every, po every posing of a, of a limit de facto on formal grounds alone is the surpassing of that limit in order to mark the limit. You've already thought the other side of it. So, so Kant's whole effort to think the bounds of experience by, pros by proscribing um, which, what was essentially impossible, the step beyond experience, already, already um, extended the, the range of um, the scope of, of, of thinking beyond what Kant was able to tolerate. So the phenomenology is... Um, um, as the name suggests, it's about experience. It's about the race, about the realm of, of phenomena. Um, um, so what is, the, what is the logic, which is no longer trafficking in appearances and is no longer um, dwelling within the sphere of experience? Is it, um, is, is it, it we're, no, we're no longer talking about conscious or self-conscious subjectivity. We're, we're talking about pure thinking. Is, is, is Hegel venturing into some kind of uh, upgraded version of a noumenal thinkability that cannot be experienced? Um, or what is it in experience itself that, that, that precipitates into the impossibility of experience? And this is the point at which I think the, uh, Hegel it really um, feeds into some, some, so, some, some anachronistic issues of, of the limits of, of consciousness. What, what is it in consciousness that tilts beyond itself? Are we talking about some kind of unconscious? Um, a strange way to think of a of a work whose scaffolding is, seems to be so so perfect, um. and it's if if you raise that kind of question, it's absolutely astonishing if you take a look at contemporary at the contemporary state of Hegel reception because Hegel is not at all anymore the bête noir because everybody seems to have become a Hegelian. That's quite astounding, but in a, in a very specific kind of sense, um, almost in a, as if there is something like a Kantian Hegelianism, right? I mean, there is a certain kind of Hegelianism which emphasizes that there uh, Fred, Frederick Jameson once called it Habermasian Hegelians, uh, which um, um, basically describes a, a, a kind of approach which emphasizes a certain understanding of what it means that we're rational and practical human beings, right? Namely, that we're always already in a kind of, that's the, the catchword or keyword, normative space. So we make normative moves and so forth. But that is clearly, I mean, clearly, but that is, seems to be a conscientizing of Hegel in the sense that there is a kind of transcendental form, right? I mean, um, so there is space of reasons is the, the contemporary name that is often given to that, to, that, to that very form. So you might wonder, is that all just uh, a weird philological kind of super nerdy Hegel thingy, right? And it kind of is on the one hand side, but not only because with the, um, or it has implications for, uh, not only for Hegel, uh, or for an uh, understanding of Hegel that is not limited to, let's say, philological debates, because there is a lot of, a lot at stake with the question of how to actually read and understand the tra transition from the phenomenology into the logic. I've already said um, um, that it's about the question of a new beginning, cleaning the slate, and all these kinds of things, right? But it's also, if you, if you emphasize, as we try to do, the, let's say, twosomeness of the books, right? There are two books, and one has to just, like, emphasize their respective uh, projects, and that they work kind of side by side. One, one, one immediately shatters the cliche image of Hegel as not only the philosopher of the one or totality, but what would Hegel look like if he were a philosopher of the two, if you wish? Just like formally, right? I mean, he wrote two books, and it's quite a difficult to account for, for the relation between, between the two of them. Maybe that's a systematic point, right? Maybe there is reason in this twosomeness to, to uh, emphasize that again. And that resonates with certain 
clearly with certain tropes in, think of Marxism or psychoanalysis, right? I mean, a certain understanding of class struggle also emphasizes twosomeness and the non-relationality of the uh, classes in struggle and a certain understanding of psychoanalysis also emphasizes the non-relation between right, what is constitutive um, uh, for sex beings. So, yeah. um, so uh, let me add one, one, one more thing. So in a sense, Hegel might prove, if you want a, want a more uh, trivial formula for that, to offer an interesting account to what in the 20th century was coined under the label of philosophy of difference. Right? So maybe Hegel, in this very <coughs> setup of his system, like in the two books, gives an interesting um, um, account of what it means to think difference, to conceive of difference. Right. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, and speaking of, speaking of uh, class struggle and thinking of um, Marx um, and thinking about a form of um, class struggle being, a, you know, having to be ultimately, um, if, if one is to be Marx, a t taking binary form rather than a pluralistic form, um, what is it, what, what is that? What does that twofold? How can we think that twofold without um, uh, invoking notions of symmetry and um, polarity and uh, and thus reconciliation? What, 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 how does one think of antagonism um, in a differentials way, which is not going to just disperse into a kind of plurality of small differences? Um, so, just to get back to reality for a moment. Um, Hegel is, Hegel is, um, he Hegel is, is writing the phenomenology um, in the, pretty well the direct aftermath of the French Revolution as you, as you all know. Um, and one, and, and to, to, to conclude this work, um, and this is a work which, as, as, as we've been saying, um, is the clearing, involves the clearing away of just about everything. I mean, by the end of the phenomenology, nothing, um, no, no appearance, no givenness, no, no um, and, and concretely, no institutional arrangements, no, po no, no political formations that have yet um, seen the light of day are, are still standing. Um, so we're left with this kind of, you know, this is complicated, of course, but we're left with this kind of blank slate. Everything has been taken away. And this is the really condition for the logic um, as this thought experiment, setting aside the details of what's happening in the logic and through the logic. Um, the logic really begins um, as the, this God talk uh, aside, um, but this is the, the extent of the grandeur of the project, really is, is the project what it means to think anew, what it means to build anew, what it means to, to construct a world um, which has done away with all the givenness of, of tradition. This is one way of understanding the, the, um, the, the tradition at stake. So um, for Hegel, and this, this relates to the sort of the political stakes, I think. Hegel is, is writing the, he's, he's kind of the, the the political possibilities have, have kind of dried out by the time he's finished the phenomenology. He doesn't actually know. Um, there's nothing on the horizon. There's no return. There's no return possible to a pre-revolutionary state. He does not know what the successor will be. Um, and the the the. It, the, the, the last part of the phenomenology is running through all the kind of non-revolutionary um, cultural uh, alternatives to political revolution, all of which are, are emphatically um, disproven or, or re, 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 um, contested by Hegel. And it's very interesting in this respect that the, 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 the ending of the phenomenology, that uh, the Hegel's last gesture seems to be to give the word to Schiller or to invoke Schiller, to put Schiller on stage in such a way. Um, it's not just an empty uh, uh, invocation of, of literature or poetry or a, a sort of a attestation to the limits of discursive thinking. Um, Schiller is kind of the bete noire of this whole project insofar as Schiller um, is the figure um, who never makes a, a real appearance in the phenomenology proper. I mean, the, 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 the very possibility of an aesthetic uh, politics. This is, this is kind of pushed out to the end as a, um, 
as an as, as a unsolved problem. And it's in this respect um, that, the, that the phenomenology, uh, we think, um, really ends by making a kind of political, staging a political um, uh, demand is too strong a word for it, but a political challenge to, to, to the, you know, to, to, to the reader, the reader being a, you know, much broader than someone sitting there poring over a text looking for punctuation marks. The, the reader is, is, the, is, the, is the collective um, recipient of, of Hegel. And this is, in a, in, a, in a sense, continued in the beginning of the, of the science of logic, because, I mean, I think Kierkegaard was the first who noticed that the science of logic of Hegel begins very strangely, because Hegel himself raises the question, can we begin by basically simply getting rid of all presuppositions and then of the presupposition that this is a presupposition? And then, and, and then Kierkegaard basically said, well, that is just like infinite regress, right? And so how, how I, right, because you always want to get rid of something and you introduce just another presupposition by getting rid of that and you do that endlessly. And then, Hegel does something interesting in the beginning of, of, the, of, the, of the logic because he basically says, well, the only thing by which we can begin is a resolve, an Entschluss in German, a kind of decision. Um, and Kierkegaard basically thinks, well, that is because Hegel couldn't get out of this shitty, endless, in, infinitely endless loop, right? He had to break it off and basically say, well, stop it, just like I, I want to start. But we thought, what if that Entschluss um, indicates a different understanding of freedom. Somehow, even people who today um, assimilate Hegel into the more liberal camp and, right, I mean, soften him and turn him into like a very a thinker of recognition or what, what, whatever, so uh, very commode tropes, if you wish. Um, they, they emphasize that Hegel is a thinker of freedom, and uh, right. I mean, and one could say, well, if if Hegel is a thinker of freedom, and freedom is kind of a stake in this overall project, with all its political implications, what kind of freedom is the freedom of this resolve of that Anschluss? I mean, very trivially, we wondered who the hell does even make that kind of decision, because uh, right. I mean, we just like cleared the slate so profoundly that we end up. Right, with God before the creation of the world and finite history, right? So um, it's a, a, a very peculiar kind of, kind of resolve or decision taken, which sort of, I mean, in, 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 in our reading resonates with what, for example, like in, in psychoanalysis is called choice of neurosis, right? I mean, it's a kind of very, very strange choice which precedes all choices. It's not what, what the French theorist of catastrophes, Jean-Pierre Dupuis, once called supermarket freedom, right? Where you basically have a lot on display and basically like that Coke more than that or whatever burger or a car or whatever, right? I mean, it's a choice which kind of, kind of precedes the agent of that very choice because it's constitutive of that very agent, right? So, I mean, in different terms, when and how and why did God decide to create just because he could? Maybe because he wouldn't be God if he didn't, or I mean, right? I mean, that, that, these questions are are um, at stake. So, and what what we try to emphasize that, in a sense, this this resolve or decision is not a sovereign decision anymore. It cannot be a sovereign decision, right? If you choose the way, I mean, choice of neurosis. You you want to translate it in something like, how do you choose the way in which you dream? Right? I mean, what kind of choice is that kind of choice? It's clearly somehow in you, but it's not that you're totally able to do that, right, on a Friday night, it's because you just want different kinds of dreams over the weekend or whatever, right? I mean, so it is a freedom that cannot simply be a capacity is inside, outside. So it, all these strange kind of things um, happen at that point and bring back discussions that, that have to do with the, again, Right, maybe history of philosophy wise or system, uh, system, uh, systematics wise, a uh, Kant Hegel debate about right, what is the status of freedom, noumenal, experiential, or whatsoever. I think I'm sort of mindful of the time actually, yeah. so I, I think maybe we should. Um, but did you, you, I will now ironically be pathetic, did you express what you wanted to, or <laughs> do you need some more time? <laughs> yeah. well, 
<laughs> who expresses what they want to. <laughs> okay, then yeah. uh, just some brief remarks. Most, uh, first, just to elaborate the background to be clear to you. Did you notice how till 20, 30 years, maybe 40, uh, there were two main perceptions of Hegel, conservative and revolutionary. Mm -hmm. Either Hegel was or the neoconservative, like, no, not abstract liberal democracy, we need some organic order, or it was negativity, destroy it all, and so on. What defines our time, and that's why this Hegel is the most dangerous, I agree with both of you, this uh, uh, liberal Hegel. Now, all of a sudden, we have a liberal Hegel, a middle-of-the-road Hegel, and you can immediately recognize it with two features, which ex exactly mirror your duality on logic and phenomenology. The logic is deflated, as you mentioned, in the sense that it's no longer about, in whatever way I put it, the basic structure of the world, whatever. It's simply a kind of... Uh, epistemological reflection on all possible ways of reasoning. It's the general theory of discourse, if you want. And politically, you recognize it by the term uh, recognition, which is, I think, totally one-sided. Are people even aware how rarely uh, Hegel mentions the term uh, recognition? And that's, I think, the importance of what you are doing. You are the true alternative to this new predominant, everybody likes him now, even in Pentagon, in State Department, Fukuyama, and so on, <laughs> this liberal Hegel. Second thing, uh, it's so important what you said about binary. The, no, precisely about this duality, in this case, lo uh, uh, logic phenomenology, I think today it's very fashionable to be against binary logic, you know, like two sexes. No, there are multiple sexes. And then the two enters as a kind of oppressive gesture, you know. The, the two totalizes, castrates, whatever you want, the multiplicity. But what Hegel allows us to think is precisely a kind of a duality, twofoldness, which is not binary. The, the, the most stupid thing to do would be, for example, to try to, in this mythic, pre-modern way, sexualize logic phenomenology and say, I don't know, logic is masculine, pure, pure thinking, phenomenology is uh, feminine. It's not this. It's, uh, it allows us to think a non-binary twofoldness. And third uh, point, uh, when you, this dash, you know, that you mentioned. I found another use of the dash in theory often. For example, I'm sorry for the stupidity of this example. Marxism dash Leninism. Mm. What does this mean? It's not simply a continuation like Lenin just developed. No, it's mediated by an by a utter failure, despair. For L Lenin, although one must be very careful here, Lenin never talked about Leninism. Leninism is a Stalin's retroactively dream. But nonetheless, remember, Lenin, even here, Hegel's logic immediately intervenes. I mean, Lenin was totally desperate at the beginning of World War I. Everything collapsed, basically the whole classic Marxist concept of evolution towards revolution, slow and so on, collapsed. And what did Lenin do, as you know, literally? He went to Switzerland and started to read Hegel's logic, no? And what I like tremendously, so again, Marxism, Leninism, it's not just uh, Lenin developed Marxism, no, there is a fiasco, total loss, and then Lenin intervenes from outside from a totally external position, and there is always a, a contingent gap here. You cannot really develop uh, uh, Leninism out of Marx and so on and so on. And I don't have time to go into it now, but exactly the same goes, I think, for Freud and Lacan. Lacan intervenes brutally from the outside. His uh, theoretical reference from the point from which Lacan intervenes into Hegel uh, is, is precisely a different one. It is of uh, structural linguistics and so on and so on. So a couple of brief uh, remarks. First, 
I think, as an old Stalinist, it's so important what you say. I don't know which of you. I'm old, senile, I confuse. This, uh, uh, this emphasis on Hegel as doing uh, 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 cleaning, chimney sweeping, and so on. I think without even great irony that Hegel is engaged in a purge which, oh my God, where is poor Stalin with his small purges, you know? Like, Hegel does an incredibly more radical, more radical uh, purge, and uh, in both books, as you emphasize. So, uh, again, I will not go into this properly parallax relationship between phenomenology logic, because it's a much more delicate relationship. The problem is not to pass from one to the other. Hegel himself is trespassing all the time. The problem is not, can I go from here to there, when I'm in logic to phenomenology or back? The po problem is to define the difference as such. It's almost a little bit like uh, Lacan's reading of that uh, uh, tor uh, turtle and uh, Achilles or what. Of course, Achilles can always overcome the turtle, but he cannot reach the turtle. He can run after and bypass. He cannot get there. So uh, I like very much what you emphasize, I don't know which of you, about these problems, that how this duality is precisely not the historicist duality of horrible worst reading of Hegel, which is Hegel is totally crazy in his logic, God, ha ha, but Hegel is good in his concrete historical analysis, ethics, phenomenology, that is the Hegel. Yes, I don't know which one of you indicates, isn't it a beautiful paradox that most conservative readers on Hegel of Hegel, focus precisely on historical topics. While all Lenin and others, radical revolutionaries, much preferred logic. Even Marx, he was in a crisis how to reconceptualize all of it uh, uh, from his early, I think, pretty bad vulgar evolutionism of German ideology. So what did he read to elaborate his critique of political economy? Hegel's logic, not... Uh, phenomenology, and I find this a wonderful paradox. The way to be a reactionary is, let's take a concrete historical analysis. The way to be a social revolutionary is, let's think what God is thinking before <laughs> the creation of the world. But now, I wouldn't be myself without finishing with two evil remarks. One, it's not so much a criticism of you, it's just a question. Okay. You nicely develop this duality logic phenomenology as parallax, you know, you need both, you trespass all the time, but you cannot define the limit as such. But then, as you, Frank, indicated, I love this thesis that Hegel basically wrote in this radical, even a little bit existentialist sense of an engagement. You can see, to put it pathetically, how Hegel suffered the active process of thinking when he was writing these two books. And then he wrote basically two other books, if you discount lectures and shorter texts, uh, uh, Encyclopedia and, Phenom uh, and uh, Philosophy, Rechtsphilosophy, Philosophy of Right, which you describe them, I think this is your part, Frank, which are, okay, we can put it maybe in this way, in primitive psychoanalytic terms. Uh, Phenomenology and logic are hysteria at its best. Permanent self-questioning, I'm saying this, why I'm saying this, am I really saying this? While, uh, 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 phenomenolo uh, sorry, while uh, encyclopedia and philosophy of right are pure university discourse, not only in the technical sense that they are notebooks, and, but already the forum, paragraphs, and this, as you, Frank, I think, put it, she is reporting, giving a report on notional breakthroughs which are already supposed to take place elsewhere. Like, he doesn't, it's not a living thought. Okay, my, I'm asking you, maybe I read your book too primitively, but 
What about admitting as immanent to Hegel this duality itself? What if we shouldn't say the good Hegel of creative existential thinking about this bad bureaucratic Hegel? What if the true strength of thinking is say, fuck it, no, I will not stick in my stupid existential authenticity. I'm strong enough to make a pass into university bureaucracy. That's my question. Maybe I read you too, different, too uh, easily, but with my Stalinist mind, I detected a little bit of this tendency, you know, of good Hegel, passion, existential thinking <laughs> against the back bureaucratic Hegel. And you know that I can resist anything but not temptation, like Oscar Wilde, but an obscenity. <laughs> when you mentioned not just death, but all these uh, uh, multiple meanings of a world, I will tell you a dirty joke from Argentina, which plays on a double meaning of a word, and I think Hegel would have loved it, because Hegel goes in the same, same similar obscene direction a couple of times, for example, you know, about phrenology, the same organ, urination, the highest and the lowest. You know, the verb coger in Spanish, in Spain, it just means uh, to grab something, to get hold of or whatever. While in Argentina, I don't know how it is. I think also in some other Latino American countries, I'm not sure, it's the F word. Like coger a woman means F and so on. So the eternal joke, very Hegelian, I claim, is this one. A stupid Spanish tourist kept, uh, goes to, comes to Argentina and says, Donde puedo coger un taxi? And the answer is, you can try in the exhaust fume, but it will not be very pleasant. <laughs> with this Hegelian joke, I finish, and now you take over, I think, with Q&A. <laughs> ah, sorry, just maybe, no, no, stay there. One, you know, you were right when you emphasized it's not about German language. Hegel was here extremely non-nationalist opportunist. I read somewhere for some time where he was searching for a job, he even played with the idea of getting a job in Amsterdam or somewhere in Netherlands. And he was already writing the, uh, his friends there, please tell me all possible words with many meanings and so on and so on. No, <laughs> Hegel is not Heidegger. For him, there is no deeper authenticity in German language and so on and so on. He was absolutely immediately... And that's the beauty of Hegel, that, uh, you know, Hegel, absolute idealist and so on. But isn't this a beautiful reversal of how the pure speculative thought, logic, mind of God, the only way to articulate it, it's not in some pure, formalized, logical language, but it's by using what is most contingent and irrational, if you want, in language, double meanings and so on and so on. That's why Hegel would have been appalled by this analytic procedure of, oh, you are using a word in multiple meanings, let's clarify the meanings and so on. I stop. I talk too much, I'm sorry, <laughs> please. Um, hi, I'm Emily Aster, I'm in comparative literature, and um, I'm just going to give a hand on moderating, moderating the discussion. Um, I'm wondering if uh, Rebecca and Frank would like to respond to anything that Zizek raised first, and maybe I'll throw as a writer into that. If you could come back, because I think Zizek mentioned it already, to giving us a little bit more of a hold on this question of the monster and the absolute, and absolute knowledge, which of course Slavoj has also been working on uh, for a long time. And if you can also then answer my reproach, yeah, yeah. bureaucracy, mm -hmm. yeah. right. university. Right, I want to answer that reproach first as a way of getting into this question of the, 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 the absolute, which are um, enunciated um, seemingly from the position of absolute knowing, but are not, and this is not really meant as an insult, they're not engaged in the production of absolute yes, knowing yes, itself. Yes. And this is part of, this is part of the absolute. Um, yes, and it's, it's inherent, yeah, yeah. you're talking about speculative words, I mean it's inherent in um, the, the most speculative word of all, which is Wissen. Um, absolute is Wissen, is, 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 both, um, is both absolute knowing 
in the verbal um, active sense of, 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 of uh, what we're calling for shorthand subjectification, it means the production of a, of a, of a self-knowing um, knowledge, and um, Wissen as, as knowledge, um, the nominal form, and that's, that's contained in the word itself, which, which is to say that the, 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 um, the degradation um, or bureauc bureaucratization, which is um, at work in an encyclopedic university discourse, which is about transmission, which is about uh, neutrality, which is about all the things of which the university discourse is, is often reproached. That it, it is not in itself a, um, uh, outside the absolute. It's actually part of the, part of the d diminution of the inherent in the absolute itself. So it's a, uh, it, this, um, yeah, it's, it's this deflation is, is, is itself part of it, rather than being something to be um, veered away from. Now you can answer with the absolute. Well, thank you. Uh, <laughs> no, I also want, to, want to, just like very quickly. Um, I mean, th this is why one could say, if one if one goes through just like the systematic place of the book, right? Uh, books, you, one could assume, okay, the phenomenology of spirit is the intro to the system. Then we get the science of logic, and what happens then? Then comes the encyclopedia, and what does the encyclopedia do? It immediately repeats the sense of logic, right? So we get, we end the sense of logic, and Hegel does that with a very grandiose idea where the absolute idea releases, that's his term, itself into nature. But we don't immediately get nature, but we get a kind of as if naturalized version of the logic in the encyclopedia before we approach the philosophy of nature. And I mean, just to make that more intelligible to everyone who has not even opened the book, I mean, we are basically wondering, uh, for example, or m making an even formal difference. I mean, the encyclopedia of Hegel is structured in paragraphs, right? You start with paragraph one, and very randomly you end at 400 something, right? Which doesn't captured the structure of the signs of logic, or even though the English has right, the paragraphs, but the German doesn't, um, and maybe it captures nonetheless some encyclopedic tendency of the phenomenology, but any, anyhow, th this doesn't, I mean, this isn't in the phenomenology or the logic. So there is just, just a formal difference, right? In the encyclopedia, you get from one to two to three, and sort of relying on numbers, right? Just like you are, must be able to count, and then you know how to get from one to two, and from I don't know, 237 to 238, which you, this kind of security you don't have in the logic, right? And this is why I mean, this is why there. What we're saying about this difference could be read that the science of logic and the phenomenology are cool books, and the encyclopedia isn't, right? I mean, it's the uncool book or whatever, but. Hegel himself talks in the science of logic about what he calls relapses, rückfälle, right? So some, something, and that is eternal to the unfolding of the absolute, right? So it is not only, and that has to do also with a certain, let's say, liberalist or liberal reading of Hegel. It's not that Hegel is simply a progressist, right? It's always continually getting better. But there can be relapses, right? I mean, one can relapse. I mean, he calls that even sublation in vain, right? I mean, so something can be sublated and not sublated at the same time. And sometimes that can be productive and sometimes it cannot be. But it's a systematic and integral part. So about the absolute, um, um, why we emphasized so much the transition or non-relation or between the, and the twosomeness of the books because our hunch is that what is at stake at that very transition where, I mean, that transition which sort of is the systematic place of absolute knowing, right? Is, and Rebecca al already said that, um, a question of what does it mean to constitute or reconstitute subjectivity, right? What does it mean to begin anew, not begin anew a project, but just like to really begin anew, right? And in a sense, that means it is the systematic place where questions of transformation or revolution, or whatever you want to call that, are, are placed. That, that is to say, it is a very peculiar kind of knowing if it is an active kind of practice. This is why we emphasize this, this kind of weird decision, right? Um, I mean, to use a cheesy example that I 
sometimes, uh, like you use, so, I mean, what does it mean to decide to fall in love, for example, right? I mean, what kind of decision is that kind of decision? It is, I mean, it is not a, a decision by objective criteria, right? I mean, you're not basically saying, well, the salary seems okay, height is okay, and I like the hair color and the eyes or whatever. I mean, that would be weird to describe it that way, right? So it is a, a, a weird kind of decision for which one, and that is then the catch, is only oneself radically responsible nonetheless, even though one has not, and this is why we're talking about other sightness and, and so ever in, uh, whatsoever in the book, um, be, because um, one did not consciously make that kind of decision, and this is where we believe that, that is what we believe is at stake with regard to that very concept. Does that? That yeah. helps in listening to you that this would then be the kind of Kant Hegel thing around debates around willkür and freedom of choice and what's mm -hmm. the status of choice in this mm -hmm. case that you've just raised. But I'll just let that dangle on the dash. Uh, I think we should open it up to general questions. Um, and then, yeah. So, anyone want to jump in? Hey, thanks for that. Um, the response to this might have already been lost in the dash somewhere. But I guess my only question is, going back to absolute knowing and absolute knowledge, are you saying that there's a complete discontinuity between absolute knowing and the kind of knowing that's deployed in the science of logic? No. Um, what I was, um, what we were suggesting was, and I'm not, I'm not sure that discontinuity is the right word, but a, a certain a, a dissonance is registered between the absolute knowing um, in which the phenomenology culminates and from which um, the logic is, is born um, and absolute knowing as a, as a verb and the absolute knowledge, um, which is the encyclopedic discourse which is the object of, of knowing. So that would be the, 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 that would be the disjunction, which is, which is produced by the absolute itself, which is why it's not, it's not really an external disjunction, it's an internal one. But may I, very briefly, and uh, uh, I think it's important what the two of you indicated all the time that we don't have time now, but we should really redefine in a closer, sorry, analysis, what do we mean by absolute? Because we have a certain primitive idea, absolute ooh, uh, some kind of a up there, absolute, untouchable, unchangeable, and so on. Hegel, you put it very precisely, that if there is a moment of absolute knowledge in Hegel, it's more in this uh, interspaces, passages, and so on, for example. But it has, one has to emphasize this again and again. Hegel does not mean that now, e e even if it is in very vague sense, we are at the end, we know it all. There are so many proofs of this. For example, last, correct me if I'm wrong, but the last text, short, that Hegel wrote is a critique of the English Reform Bill, which made a step towards uh, general... Um, I mean, uh, right, to, how do you call it, vote, uh, general elections. Uh, and for Hegel, it's a, it's a very strange conservative text, but very subversive. Hegel is more or less horrified. My God, what is happening? And so on. Second point, look at introduction to philosophy of history, where in two cases, and this proves that empirical Hegel was not an idiot, I claim. Two cases, when he deals with Russia and with United States, and be careful, he wrote, and wrote this in 1800, late teens, 20s, he says, these two nations, he speaks separately of them, haven't yet reached their speculative uh, form, whatever, it will be up, the next century will be theirs. We cannot say it now. So again, uh, 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 again, it's not simply, uh, uh, it's not simply uh, uh, we know it all. Second point, and this is an additional question to you, then I shut up, I'm sorry. Uh, you know what, in, it's, on the one hand, it's true, encyclopedia reports on acquired knowledge. But the most wonderful moments in encyclopedia are those where, although he acts, behaves, as if I'm just reporting on what I already went through, 
a marvelous formulation happens here and there. The one, for example, that I quote all the time, this wonderful formulation against all historian optimist evolution is that reconciliation is not that you overcome duality, but that you realize that duality was always already overcome. It's strictly retroactive. And Another point where Hegel is for me at his best, and how honest he is. You know, he has this generally dismissive attitude towards mathematics, you know. Oh, it's just quantitative, formal thinking, blah, blah. But if there ever was a symptom, it's look in the logic, the part on differential calculus. It's extra, it's like 50, 60, 70 pages. And why is he struggling with it? Because to simplify it, with differential calculus, mathematics does, mathematics does something that, according to Hegel, shouldn't be able to do, no? To move into uh, qualitative, conceptual, uh, qual qualitative conceptual thinking. Another proof. At the very um, end, and Savoy, can I end. just... Okay, I stop, I stop. I'm just going to be a little interventionist I'm sorry, here. Please, and yes. Frank, did you have any response to that question about, uh, or on the encyclopedia, on, on encyclopedia question? No, that's it? Okay. All right. Sorry to interrupt you. I shut up now. Um, Sorry. A question, he uh, well, for question here. I just have a, a few things. The first thing, um, you just said that there's the dash between Marxism and Leninism. I'm wondering there's another dash that happened later, Marxism, Leninism, Maoism. I'm wondering what you thought about that. And I think these are all related. You said the one and the two. So what's the difference between the one and the two? Is it two things? Is it one thing in two places? Is it one thing and a thing in a place? And then another thing you mentioned is symmetry, but what about asymmetry? Does anyone want to take that? It was sort of a, a Zizek question, but Frank, did you want to jump in? Okay, oh, then I will one? say, but one sentence, I promise. <laughs> the best answer was given I hope we are all Beckettians. Beckett, no? There is no duality here. One is shit, the other one is good. Joyce is bad, Beckett is good. And Beckett wrote something so wonderful, I don't know where. He said, one divides into itself. That's the perfect. You know, Hegel is not, two emerges when one wants to become one. And that would be the starting point of my answer, but I promised I will not talk, please. <laughs> <laughs> just, an, uh, just an addendum on this question of asymmetry um, and whether the two, whether the two, whether, whether a, a two um, can be conceived in a non-binary, non-reciprocal, non, um, which would change the nature of mediation as being, um, whether, I guess the question I would put back is, is does it, that asymmetry um, is not incompatible with reversibility? And reversibility, therefore, is, is not about symmetry either, not simply about reversing, uh, you know, changing places or um, reversing master for slave or something like that. But that, that the the positions are doing doing work on each other. Maybe just very quickly. I mean, the 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 whole. This is why we emphasize that a uh, whole two books. Thing, right, because one could say, well, isn't it just like the same project and he wrote about it twice? And we're kind of saying no, <laughs> because um, it's not two times the same thing, but it's totally unclear what the two things are. I mean, it's just clear they're two, right? <laughs> and they're not two of a kind. And that, I mean, you, you can see that in, in the history of Hegel reception. The, 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 the whole temptation was somehow to reduce it to just like one, I mean, it's just one book. Like, it's the same movement as in a, in a phenomenology, right? I mean, that would be one temptation. And there are many others who are basically saying, well, the phenomenology is just like applied abstract structures that we get then in the science of logic, for example, right? Thereby, you're basically saying, well, there are no two books. And so we wondered what does it mean to account for the two sumness, if you wish, of the two books, and we, um, and that must mean, in one way or the other, not to immediately identify a simple repetition of one and the same thing, right? I mean, it's not like two times one, and this is where a 
difficult account of, let's say, difference or asymmetry and so forth. This is where precisely it takes, right, occurs, right, and becomes a systematic and conceptual question. Does that make sense? There was a question, um, yeah. Hi. Uh, yeah, my question is kind of related. It's about dualism. Mm -hmm. um, and it's also sort of to Slavoj about sort of if Hegel and Lacan come together and Lacan builds his theory from structuralism, sort of Levi-Strauss and Jakobsen, I'm wondering how we should think about like formalism in the sense of in structuralism, a system of discrete signs um, and the way that what was being formulated there was um, part of, was connected to the origins of computer science and sort of computational systems. So Heidegger's critique of Hegel in many ways is that Hegel is the ultimate metaphysician and also that metaphysics culminates in a kind of cybernetics or pure computation of deductive logic. And so the science of logic is, is supposed to be seen as kind of a deductive system a pure computational, in some sense, sequence um, of concepts and propositions. So I'm kind of wondering how, how do you think Hegel, how exactly does Hegel um, escape being sort of the culmination of perhaps a vision of pure computation? And at the same time, how is that related to the question of formalism in structuralism? I can risk if you want, very briefly. I think, really briefly, I think that uh, first, uh, you know, what do we mean by formalism? If anything, and I think you, Frank, proved it in detail that Hegel is a mega formalist, and what is best in Marx is exactly this uh, formalism. For Hegel, Hegel, so this pseudo dialectics, forum follows content and so on. No, forum precedes content. But we don't have time to go into this. I, uh, this question about uh, kubernetes and so on. I think there is a certain movement of self-referentiality and retroactivity. I'm uh, in, in dialectics in the Hegelian sense, for which, and I had, I had long debates with uh, artificial intelligence people, and they didn't give me a clear answer, which I am not sure how you can translate them into formalized logic and what computers do. If you allow me very briefly to tell you a joke which we use all the time, I used it already some, in this room, I think, about 10 times. You know that Ninochka joke. A guy comes to a cafeteria and says, can I get a coffee, please, but without milk? And the waiter says, sorry, we don't have milk, we just have cream, so I can only give you coffee without cream, you know. This is the basic Hegelian point, negative determination. Okay, now, the point is this one. The coffee that you get is the same coffee, but speculatively, Plain coffee is not the same as coffee without milk, which is not the same as coffee without cream, although they're materially the same. The difference is purely virtual. Now I'm asking you a very naive question, and with this I will stop. Can a computer reproduce this? You know that something is, but it differs with reference to what? To its virtual shadow, as it were. I mean, I didn't get a clear answer to this one. But since I have a word, one sentence, I promised. I would like to ask the two of you an extremely evil question, I warn you. Dash, dash, two, which is not two. What about the dash, a book by Komei Ruda? Did you ever think about the dash of the two of you? Your book is a dash. <laughs> ah, that's, this is such a dirty trick. For this, you will burn in Hegelian hell. Okay, I stop. <laughs> Just a quick word about Hegel's formalism and formalization. I, I have to sidestep the question of cybernetics, um, except just to mention it as an totally inner Hegelian thing about mechanization and um, being um, a moment of, of thinking, but but a moment. Um, but this, but Hegel, you know, Hegel has this notion of absolute form um, 
in the, in, which is thematized in the logic, but I think is expressive of, um, not simply at a thematic level, but is expressive of, 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 of thinking, and, and, and particularly expressive of his um, strange relationship to Kant, who's usually reproached, I mean, usually in the name of Hegel, Kant's empty formalism is criticized, um, and, and Kant is criticized for just being a formalist and having no, you know, no access to real stuff, like Hegel, you know, um, which, which Hegel seems to have. That's, that's kind of Kant's dualism. Um, Hegel's point is, is um, in a sense, hyper-Kantian because he, um, he, 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 he privileges form. I mean, in the, in the um, antithesis, you know, the inherited antithesis of form, which is form and content or form and matter, we can, you know, it has many different f forms. Um, what is unquestioned in that received dichotomy um, is the is the binarity itself, right? And so form is, a, in that sense, reified um, and deformalized in the, in the way in which form and matter, form and content are, have been traditionally received. So in a certain sense, the, the idea of absolute form is, the, is a commitment to, um, to a form that's so pure that it de-reifies uh, itself. It, cannot, it, can, it no longer occupies a a determinate position in the binary of form and content. Um, and that's why um, one must opt for form in a certain sense. Because um, only as such does one uh, cease to reproduce um, what is, what is, um, what, be, what becomes a substantified notion of form, including the form which takes itself as its own content. So that's just kind of a, this is part of a long argument we make at some point in the mm -hmm. in the book, but that would be the that would be the point of, of the sort of surprising Hegel's surprising advocacy of a kind of formalism because it's not what one thinks that he's doing um, in getting over kinds of approach to Kant is actually that he's not formalist enough. Yeah, yeah, so, that's yeah. crucial. That's the formal right. idea. Yeah, Frank, did you want to? No, I think that's. The way you described the dash, and I, my apologies, I, I haven't even opened your book, right? But I'm curious to it's do on so. The cover, um, <laughs> I haven't even read the cover, right? So, um, so what you said about the, uh, the the ambiguity of the dash, right? Very much reminded me of, uh, in, and and also what, what what you then elaborated on that regarding the temporality, the suspension. Very much reminded me of. Uh, of Kierkegaard, mm. right, and and and, and mm. Kierkegaard, who is, uh, and, and and you talked about the mode of representation of philosophizing. So apparently, with Kierkegaard, we are entering very much into a literary mode of representation. He's very aware of of, of also punctuation marks, and if I'm not mistaken, so the punctuation as the dash plays a significant role in his work on irony. So I was uh, I was uh, struck by that, and 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 uh, what 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 he would argue is basically he would make a, a case for the misunderstanding for the uh, for the um uh, for the uh, for the indirect communication, right? And the, I guess one could see the dash in Kierkegaard as being part of this, uh, of, uh, being part of this indirect communication. What one would further would call the performative dimension of his f uh, of his thinking, right? Uh, or what what Deleuze would probably call the theatricalization of his philosophy. And I was wondering whether you would go so far in Hegel as to argue, okay, your approach by taking the dashes seriously of the punctuation marks mm -hmm. brings us towards a performative dimension in Hegel's thought. Thank you. Um, did you want, did you want to I think that, uh, just start, just, I mean, just a quick word, because um, uh, absolutely, um, and, and it brings out uh, not simply um, the more obvious performative dimensions of the phenomenology, which is, which is indirect you know, free and direct style, basically. I mean, it's one position being occupied after another, um, spoken from the position of that, uh, but, but, but with the dramaturge, you know, somewhere in the works who's not quite that position. Um, but it also brings out, which, you know, to my knowledge, Brecht was the only person really to notice about the science of logic when he, you know, calls it this big comedy that, you know, these categories sit down and have, you know, sit down to, you know, and have this fight being in nothing, have this argument, and then they all sit down to dinner as if nothing had ever happened before. I mean, Brecht was the one person who actually noticed that the logic itself was, um, was behaving in a, in a performative uh, uh, mode. But thank you. I'm going to let Frank do that. <laughs> you can have um, uh, Very quick. Uh, 
in in a sense, we're we're using a term coined by Werner Hamacher, like a German complex recently died, uh, and he m transformed the performative into an affirmative, right? Because uh, the performative sounds too much as if they're, it, it's still obeying a transcendental logic in the sense that the form is already there and it's just like activated or realized, so perform. So the affirmative is the creation of the form in the process or practice of formation, right? And this seems to be very much what actually is happening, right? I mean, which totally, it, because if you, if you take seriously that the science of logic, for example, is a science of absolute form, what else could it mean, right? It, it must mean a certain kind of practice in which one could say, and that's why it's, why it's, why it's hyper-formal in which you're formalizing what you're just doing, right? I mean, you're, you don't have a f canon of forms, right, to which you, rec or resources already to which you could uh, refer back to. On the other hand side, I mean, there is a certain danger, and the, 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 the danger, um, um, and Rebecca b does that in her, her chapter discussing why Schiller pops up at the end of the mm -hmm. phenomenology. There is a certain, let's say, danger of, he's going to hate me for that, but I'm going to say it anyhow, a rancierian danger um, of aestheticizing, uh, basically uh, saying like the, 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 the whole movement of the dialectics points to an aesthetic ground layer, as it were. And this is some, some, something which is kind of not the case, I think, or we, we think, but, right, I mean, and, and uh, that Schiller pops up at the end of the phenomenology is a way of dealing with that very danger. Anyway, does that make sense? Because we should not forget, it always shocked me that when we speak about origins of fascism and so on, I think if there is one poem, which is it, it's Schiller's The Bell Block or what. Mm. It's absolute fascism at its most elementary. But uh, what I just wanted to add to you very briefly, I'm sorry, is that I'm glad that you mentioned Deleuze and theatricality, because Deleuze, whom I appreciate very much, makes at some point this very strange statement that all philosophers use theatricality, theatrilize the concepts, except Hegel. But I think Hegel does nothing but this. Look in phenomenology. For example, a stupidly simple example, when he talks about, how do you pronounce it in English? Ascetism, asceticism. Asceticism. Yeah, I said, yes. He does not criticize it by comparing it with how things really are. But people like to enjoy it. They are not. Uh, no, he just theatralizes, or how should I put it? He said, okay, let's imagine a scene, what is an ascetic person doing? He is torturing himself all the time and so on. So, although his official party line is, I am nothing and so on, he is dealing with himself all the time. You know, it's an extremely simple example how the whole progress of, and uh, at a different level, it's similar with absolute freedom, terror, and so on. He progresses through theatricalization of a concept. If there ever was a philosopher who does this in Hegel, I think. Okay. So I'm going to just, oh, so go ahead. One Rebecca. tiny point, what, um, one reason, another reason why performative is perhaps yeah. not entirely the right word is because things don't perform. I mean, things, things, don't, things don't work, so the performance breaks down. But it's it's not, perf not so performing well. One guy at the end who No, I'm, we really do have to wrap up, but um, I, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the audience for such fantastic questions, for the panelists, for this really deep discussion, and for to Rebecca and Frank for giving us this book, which we most of us haven't had a chance to read yet, but I will point you to the opportunity to buy it uh, right here and satisfy the urge to get closer to absolute knowledge. Uh, and um, thanks for thanks everyone. Thank you, Ron, do the proper conclusion and say something like, thanks God, it's over, you were confused, I was talking too much, it's over. That would be the true conclusion.